All right, thank you. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to tell you about some recent work I've been doing with mock images from hydrodynamical simulations. And the primary motivation for this has been covered already today. In particular, I think Liz already showed this uh, figure from a paper by Norman Grogan in 2011 of redshift two galaxies uh, observed in H-band and I-band in a couple of different classes. And this is what the human brain automatically wants to do with galaxies whenever you have a survey of galaxies like this one. And it wants to bin it into coarse bins like spheroids, disks, or mergers using either visual classifications or simple automated diagnostics. And I would like to start off the talk by saying that our current diagnostics do not take advantage of all information that's contained in observations like candles and in future surveys. Nor do they accurately classify rare but important stages of galaxy formation, nor do they necessarily, to steal a phrase from Eric from yesterday, tell plausible life stories necessarily about observations of galaxies. And so this is where we'd like to use models or simulations to tell us about how to, how to connect the dots among observations and, and, and connect them across cosmic time. Uh, and in particular, there's a quantity that simulations of any kind, any kind of cosmological or galaxy formation simulation gives you, and that's the observability time scale of anything that you might observe in this plane. So it tells you for how long a certain life event in a galaxy like a merger or clumps or, or something else could be observable in a particular survey. And so that, that observability, observability time scale is, is something I'm trying to measure. And the nice thing about that is that I can use any kind of simulation that you have. So I'll be talking today about two particular uh, efforts to do this kind of project. The first one is something we're coining the uh, Illustrious Simulation Observatory, um, riffing off of the Millennium Run Observatory and the Theoretical Astrophysical Observatory, among others, to produce a large suite of mock images from the Illustrious Simulation, resolve it in sub-kiloparsec scales, and we've started with about 10,000 galaxies at redshift zero in a volume of 100 megaparsecs on a, inside on a, of a cube. And here are some examples of what they look like on the top right. And this, of course, uh, has been motivated by a lot of great work here at Santa Cruz to produce uh, mock images from the hydro art simulations that Daniel just told us about. And I've also been studying these in a similar, similar manner. And these give us a nice complement uh, to the, the Illustrious Simulation Observatory in that they have very high time and space resolution, which you cannot get in, with the Illustrious Simulation Observatory. And this effort has been uh, uh, led for a long time here by uh, Chris Moody, a graduate student at Santa Cruz. And Liz McGrath already gave a, a, a description about this, this data set. And so uh, for this talk, I'm going to focus on very, very simple diagnostics of galaxy formation. Not going to talk a whole lot about merger diagnostics because we're just getting started. Uh, I'm going to talk primarily about kiloparsec scale measures of galaxy morphology. And so here's uh, an observational paper from Stein Boots in 2011 showing the star formation rate versus stellar mass diagram at three epochs uh, in cosmic time and showing the separation according to Sursich index of galaxies of different types. And so this is the, the main sequence of star forming galaxies. And you can see the sharp transition in average morphology toward the elliptical or spheroidal or quenched galaxies in the lower right of this diagram. And you can, with surveys like these, candles and, and others uh, measure this uh, separation across cosmic time. And so we're going to try and do the same thing as a first step in the, in the simulations. Uh, so a quick rundown of the illustrious simulation is that it was, uh, the goal was to simulate a galaxy population in a volume of 100 megaparsecs on a side, uh, resolved on scales of approximately one co-moving kiloparsec, using a physics prescription that's based on a pressurized ISM model with subgrid feedback, phenomenological subgrid feedback from supernovae and supermassive black holes, which gives you a population of something like 10,000 galaxies at redshift zero uh, with a stellar mass above 10 to the 9.5 solar masses. And these, were, these physics models were tuned to give this population so that it matches uh, certain global stellar quantities such as the, star, uh, the um, stellar mass function and the cosmic star formation rate history and the stellar mass to halo mass relation. And my contribution to the project has been to, to ask the question, okay, what do the galaxies look like? And so with my collaborator, Paul Torrey at, at, CF, at MIT now, uh, we just submitted our first paper on this. Uh, and so the idea is to take the Illustrious Simulation data and convert it into survey information like Sloan or HST surveys. And the kind of survey that we, could, we would like to do, this is only a sort of hypothetical at this point, to take all the parameters of the Illustrious Simulation, multiply them together, and we can make a survey that's approximately 100 million synthetic observations uh, from, from these galaxies across cosmic time. Uh, and so for t t today, we're just going to show a few, a few 50, tens of thousands of these uh, examples. The way we do this is we start with raw images like these. So this is a, from a paper by Shai Ganell showing galaxies of different stellar mass on the y-axis. So these are not related galaxies. They're just random galaxies viewed face on. 
from 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 11.5 in stellar mass at six representative redshifts from redshift five to redshift zero. And this is sort of the raw rest frame optical data from the, the, the simulation. And you can actually see the star particles with your eyes, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, may look unusual for a galaxy like this uh, in, in looking at it. And then we observe it with, uh, with a telescope. So we take the HST point spread functions and noise properties, and we make it, uh, images like this from those exact same uh, pixels. And so this is now the same galaxies as observed in sort of an HST ultra deep field like observation uh, of the same galaxies. So once we have these images created, uh, we can start to measure the structural parameters or, or morphologies from the, from the images. And so I'm going to focus on the Genie M20 diagram. And I promised Jen did not pay me to, to do this. I did it by choice. Uh, but th this is sort of the, the kind of uh, structural diagram that I'll be focusing on. The y-axis is the Gini coefficient, which measures the inequality among galaxies' flux values in their pixels. And so compact galaxies or galaxies with very bright cores will have a high Gini value. And sort of smooth galaxies that are, that are very, that are very, have a constant flux value will be, have low Gini values. On the x-axis is M20, which is a measure of galaxies' concentration, uh, which with more concentrated galaxies on the right and less concentrated galaxies on the bottom. So it's, it's measuring the spatial distribution of the brightest 20% of a galaxy's uh, pixels. And so in the local universe, uh, we can break this down into three regions, where mergers or merger-like objects uh, fall in the upper left. Uh, spiral galaxies or, or late type, very late type galaxies fall in the, low, in the lower, lower, lower region. And elliptical galaxies uh, or late type or early type spirals fall in the upper, upper right of this, this diagram. And so at a roughly redshift of zero, lustrous simulation galaxies look like this. This is the first uh, few thousand images that we, that we analyzed at a redshift of 0.33 uh, in a SDSS R band. And I've colored these by U minus B optical color. So this is just a, a measure of the star formation rate basically giving you the color of the points. Uh, and so the galaxies uh, separate nicely into, into ellipticals and, and spirals, and uh, possibly even some merger candidates in the upper left. Uh, and so I took a, a catalog from Gen uh, from a similar uh, redshift range to show you, just to give you an, an idea of where similar galaxies in the real universe fall. Uh, so this is just showing the, the sort of span of, of these particular morphological measurements of, of model galaxies at this redshift. Uh, and the point that I want to I make from this is not that it's perfect, but that it's uh, giving you roughly the same separation between uh, star forming and not star forming galaxies at roughly the same point, and that the, the basic the span in both the, in both the width and length is roughly similar uh, among the two samples. And so here's just the same information shown side by side, uh, with now contours outlining uh, certain cut in, in optical color. Uh, and so that's just the same information I just showed you. Uh, but we can also frame this in a slightly uh, different way and, and, and look at the first, uh, the first motivation uh, plot that I showed you. So this is now the star formation rate versus stellar mass from observations on the left and from the illustrious simulation on the right using a diagnostic made from the Gini M20 diagram, which is not exactly the search index, but it's proportional to search, search search index. And it's sort of like a, a, bold, a bulge statistic. So galaxies that are up on the upper right, uh, I would call bulgy, or lower left are disky, and you can give, get, get a measure of, of the bulgeness from that. Uh, particular quantity, and we can plot the same on the same diagram: stellar mass or star formation rate versus stellar mass, and we can see the same broad uh, broad features. And so the the main sequence of star formation here, and then the quenched ellipticals off on the right. These two plots have different scales, so it's a little hard to see exactly uh, how they line up. So I've uh, scrunched it down into the same scale here, and so you can see uh, where this exactly fall on top of the observations. Uh, so you can see the separation happens at roughly the same the same scale in all of these in, in these variables. Hey, yeah. Sure. You want to? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Uh, right. So, what was I? Where was I going with this? Uh, right. So this is uh, this something that is uh, descriptive about the simulation uh, results, but uh, I just want to sort of step back and say what I think this means. First thing is that the star formation is shut off is correlated with light profile concentration. And we've heard this uh, all week. This is sort of the, the bulge quenching uh, uh, idea that we've, we've heard about a lot. But I also think that this is perhaps not that surprising that it should have happened in this, in this particular case. Uh, in particular, I think uh, 
the, that feedback models that are set to the global stellar mass and star formation rate also naturally set the average kiloparsec scale galaxy morphology. And so we should not be very impressed that this was the case. This is kind of almost by design that the, that the average morphology at a location in this diagram uh, lines up with observations. And so looking in a little bit more detail, uh, this is now the Gini M20 diagram versus stellar mass at redshift zero. So at the top is galaxies above 10 to the 11 solar mass down here at 10 to the 9.5 or so. And we can see how the, the, the basic uh, types evolve in this according to mass. And so down here we have the uh, disky galaxies in the lower part of the diagram. And this main locus slowly shifts up toward, toward higher mass galaxies. Um, but I w wanted to point out is that the, even if the sort of average or total morphology is right at a particular place in this diagram, there may be other signatures of the physics model that are imprinted in, in, uh, in surveys like this one or uh, mock observations like this one. And so on the right, I show some rest frame optical images of the galaxies selected from certain regions in this diagram. And in particular, uh, I take the 10 most massive objects in each of these squares and color the associated regions. So up here are the elliptical galaxies, and here's the 10 most massive in this particular box. And in this one, I noticed there's some kind of bimodality among the structural parameters here. And here, up here, are the 10 most massive from the yellow box, the 10 most massive from the green box, and so on. And in particular, this separation here, I think, is uh, either an artifact or, or a prediction, however you want to phrase it, of what the, what the galaxy morphologies will look like. In particular, this one on the left has very large M20 values. So this is a log, log quantity. So these are large M20 values. So the galaxies are very extended in their bright pixels. And I think what's happening here is we're seeing sort of ring-like morphologies among a particular set of galaxies as the quenching is proceeding at, at, from lower to higher mass. Uh, and I think this has been known for a long time among, among members of the collaboration, but I was kind of surprised to actually see it in, in a diagnostic like this one and be able to, to pick it out and plot uh, images that, that, that prove it or show it. Uh, and then once we have this kind of data set, we can look, uh, look into all kinds of other, uh, how things are correlated among other parameters. And so this is now just showing the quiescent fraction uh, as a function of different uh, morphology and, and fundamental parameters from zero to one in red, one in red. Uh, so this is the half, li half light radius versus stellar mass, the Gini M20 diagnostics or bulginess on the y-axis here uh, and plotted against each other. And so for example, uh, one can say at a fixed um, radius, uh, say one KPC, that the bulge, bulgy nature of the, of the galaxy is predicting quenching. So things that are bulgy are, are, are more likely to be quiescent uh, according to, to this, this plot. Other studies you can do are to uh, inform how certain things affect, affect our observations. Uh, at the top here, I'm showing how the Gini M20 are affected by wavelength of observation. So you can see how galaxies will be shifted if they're observed in a different wavelength. Uh, and then we can perform simple models of dust uh, corrections to see how dust affects the structural measurements from, from, from surveys. And in my last few minutes, I'll be talking about a project that I've gotten involved with over the last year or so, uh, using simulations by Daniel Severino and calculations by Chris Moody to run Sunrise on these very high resolution simulations. And so to, to introduce this, this part, I'm showing up here a so-called candleized image on the left. So this is a, a galaxy mock observed at redshift two. And on the right is a very high resolution image of the same spatial region and the same colors. And so this is what comes out of the simulation, essentially, maybe a little bit lower resolution than is actually available. But I wanted to make the point that, uh, so this is kind of like an illustrious galaxy on the left, and this is kind of like a hydro arc galaxy on the right. Um, and that the, uh, a lot of information on scales smaller than Hubble can observe is contained in this kind, of, this, kind of, uh, this kind of simulation. So I think simulations of this kind are now predicting things that we may uh, think about observing in the next 10 years or so. In particular, I wanted to loop back to a, a statement made by Sandy on Monday night. And so this is kind of like the, the diagram that she showed showing a galaxy, uh, a local galaxy, uh, smoothed by a factor of 12 or so on the left. And this actually, the, the um, uh, resolution element of this, this image on the, on the right is roughly the diffraction limit of the 30 meter telescope at run, one micron. So I thought that was a neat uh, connection to make. And so the, the, the dynamics of things on this scale uh, may be approachable in the not too distant future. And my own work on this has been to uh, calculate morphology catalogs from this uh, set of simulations and try and understand how, how certain things would be observed. And so uh, this is a point that was made by Liz earlier today that uh, galaxies become more bulge dominated by, with time. And so in general, uh, uh, time goes up to the left in this diagram, galaxies are redshift two in the left, redshift one on the right. And at redshift two, they're, they're primarily in the, the late 
type uh, area of the diagram, and they sort of move smoothly up in, in average to the, to the upper right, uh, more early type galaxies. However, there are some outliers that I find, I find interesting here. And so there are, in particular, two simulations, the gray and the blue points on the right, that don't t take that particular track as the rest of, the rest of them. And in fact, some, they may even move toward the diskier region of, of the diagram. And so I just wanted to show uh, that in, in, qu in quantitative uh, form here. So this is the median Gini coefficient on the left axis as measured in the HST mock HST images versus redshift. And the blue and the gray curves are sort of coming out of this, this main locus of galaxies that are moving towards more compact or bulge-like galaxies. And there are some others that also turn around uh, at different times as well. And what we found is that these outliers in structural evolution are also outliers in merger diagnostics. So we went ahead and measured uh, different diagnostics of, from these images, and Mike Peth introduced them briefly yesterday, the so-called M, I, and D statistics. And the only thing you need to know for this talk is that the M, I, and D statistics are designed to reproduce visual classifications of galaxies. And so in, in candles, Peter Freeman in 2013 showed that the, the selection based on M, I, and D will also reproduce uh, visual classifications in certain ways. And so you can see the blue and gray points are outliers, at least in the M and I statistic, uh, for, for the duration of time that they're observed to have uh, high values of that. So that's the fraction of time on the y-axis there. And so in particular, those two simulations that are, that are coming out of this locus are also outliers in this, this kind of uh, game. And I wanted to just then finally make the point that uh, the, this is a point that Abishai made earlier in the week and is, I think, pretty important to think about. So the, uh, one of the simulations I showed uh, on the, the previous slide is Vela 15. And so from redshift two to one, I'm showing different viewing angles of the same simulation as observed in HST. So these are five different viewing angles and how it would be observed with time. Uh, and there's this particular event right here, which is a minor merger, uh, which occurs at redshift 1.2 or so. And then immediately thereafter, there's extreme growth in the brightness of the disk uh, component in this galaxy. And so as Avishai mentioned, the, the minor mergers and the, the disk physics really play, are intimately related uh, in, in galaxies like these and may be uh, observable uh, in, in diagnostics like this one. What uh, 1.2 or so. And so to put, put all of our, our merger diagnostics together, this is showing uh, our first calculation of the observability timescale of galaxy mergers in these simulations. So on the y-axis is a uh, funny quantity, which is the probability that an observed event uh, has a duration longer than t, and t is on the x-axis. And the event is defined above some threshold. So on the, in the left panel, it's the m statistic is greater than one, two, or three, or the three different colored curves. And the, the takeaway message from, from all three of these panels uh, is that the merger-like events are short. In particular, the, the, this is sort of a cast in terms of a cumulative distribution function. So if you looked at all galaxies with m above some threshold, say three, and you look at the red curve, then 50% of them, so you go down to the 50% point on the y-axis, 50% of them have a lifetime that's shorter than 100 million years. Uh, and so then the, the observability of see the, either these visually classified mergers or disturbed galaxies or what have you are, is very short on average from this sample of 10 simulations that we analyzed. Uh, and so there are then maybe 50% or 20% of other, other events which are a longer duration and maybe may sort of more drawn out uh, merger events or other events. Uh, so I'll just end there and say that it appears that galaxy physics tuned to mass and star formation rate over cosmic time also reproduces the coarse morphology on kiloparsec scales on average. Uh, the actual paths taken are diverse at z greater than one. Uh, the interactions can trigger bulge or disk growth, probably both. Uh, merger diagnostics are triggered briefly by both minor mergers and clumpy star formation. Thank you. Uh, we're using the MID statistics, uh, Freeman et al. 2013. Uh, they're relatively new and haven't really been tested yet, uh, but we're trying to work on it. Yeah. Right. So um, with the observability time scales, those are the systems that have merged that then satisfy that criterion for a certain amount of time. Not necessarily. No. So this is the, the any, gal any observation that satisfies the criterion is put into that, that plot. So they're not necessarily mergers alone. Uh, so that was any event yes. that caused you to go high, yes. and then you kept track of it for a while. And yes, for exactly. And so what fraction of those were actually mergers, what fraction of those were just stuck? That's the next question. We haven't answered, I haven't worked on that yet, but yeah.
It seems a lot of them aren't mergers, so uh, yeah. <laughs>